I'd like to know whether God exists. I'd like to know about God. I'd like to know God. I've gone through many ways of knowing, and still I do not know. Perhaps my search has been limited. Perhaps my Western Judeo-Christian vision of a personal, perfect being is misguided. What about different concepts of God, novel ideas about God, alternative gods? If there is a God, can exploring alternative concepts of God provide fresh insights into the mysterious, enigmatic nature of divinity? What can we learn from alternative gods? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and closer to truth is my journey to find out. Some may call it heresy or blasphemy, my seeking after strange gods. But it is because I desire to know God, does God exist, what God may be like, that I strive to expand possibilities, push boundaries. I go to England, to the University of Birmingham. I attend a conference on alternative concepts of God where philosophers of religion offer exotic, startling ideas. Bizarre kinds of gods are flying around. I never dreamt of such. I get a little dizzy. I meet Willem Dries, a philosopher of religion from the Netherlands, the editor-in-chief of Zygon, the journal of science and religion. Willem's theology starts with science, naturalism. Willem, your view as I understand it takes the traditional Judeo-Christian God, but molds it or, or constricts it into a more naturalistic world. How does that work, and, and does that give us more confidence that such a God may in fact exist? Yeah, my view begins, I think, with accepting the scientific story. We have come to understand reality far deeper than we did centuries ago as humans. And part of it is that it shows an enormous integrity of reality and a part also in space and time. So an image of God up there in a very spatial sense, we, can't, can't, we don't have a, a place for that. But if you appreciate the scientific understanding, still you have questions remaining, kind of limit questions about the scientific understanding. Mm -hmm. Those may be the ultimate origin of everything or the ultimate origin of the laws of nature, of the fact that the world is so well organized. And I think part of that kind of ultimate qu limit questions raises at least an open-endedness to the scientific understanding where you might say, well, there's a mystery behind it all. It's not evidence for a particular answer, sure. but it is an opening where you might have a more theistic answer. That's moving more towards some of the pantheistic uh, images where God is the world and the world is God, or panentheistic images where the world is in God, but God is bigger than the world. Do those images fit more closely with your understanding of a, of a naturalistic kind of God? Well, part of it for me is the challenge about, think about pantheism, about the world as God are issues not so much of explanation but of value, that you somehow seem to endorse everything as good. In the pantheistic view, it seems all deified. There are two concerns for me in deifying reality. One is, uh, what does it add? It, it seems pretty superfluous <laughs> in just giving it another label but <laughs> saying, well, all of reality. And the other right. is also, well, in our reality as humans, we see things uh, evil or human sin, human failures. Mm. So we also need the God language, I think, to express and differentiate morally between the, the positive and, and that which we want to criticize in the light of some higher ideal. Mm. What kind of God does that lead you to see? I mean, how does it change your, your view of what that God may be like? I think it has, for me, improved the understanding of the, the greatness of it all. This concept of the origin of it all, not in a particular time, but it's much more than just an engineer making it. So you're saying the more that you have embedded yourself within a naturalistic view, which to some people would make you more atheistic and away from theism, you're saying that that view is giving you a deeper and richer understanding of what God 
maybe like. Yes, not as a claim that I now understand it, yeah, God, sure. but as a, a way of thinking about the greatness of it all. Willem's religious naturalism centers on science. He eschews the traditional personal God. Still, to explain existence, he must go beyond science. He needs an ultimate ground of being. But if this be God, it is a slimmed down God, a God of bare essentials, a baseline beginning kind of God. I'd be disappointed, though I respect the honesty and treasure the clarity. Frankly, I admonish myself. I should fear constructing a divine edifice without foundation. Can progress be made? What about an opposing God candidate? Pantheism, where God is the world and the world is God. Willem is not impressed, but others take pantheism seriously. I speak to the co-organizer of the Alternative Concepts of God conference, philosopher of religion, Eugen Nagazawa. So pantheism says that God is identical to the universe, and pantheism says that the universe is a proper part of God. Now, this is, these views are very different from the classical concept of God, which says that there is an omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect creator. That is a personal God. That's right. And almost all arguments against the classical concept try to show that there cannot be an omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect being. And pantheism and panentheism re reject this kind of idea, so they don't face these arguments against the classical concept of God. But at the same time, pantheism and panentheism, they face all sorts of problems as well. What are some of them? Okay, the first one is the problem of unity. So pantheism, again, says that the universe is identical to God, but the universe contains a lot of different things. So how can we say that God is identical to the universe? How can we treat the universe as a single entity? Especially because uh, definitions of God like to show that God is simple. Yeah, that's right. If pantheism is true, then the universe is God, which includes a lot of complex properties and objects and so on. So it's a little bit strange to think that the universe is the greatest possible being. Another problem that pantheism and panentheism face is the origin of the universe. So according to cosmology, the universe began to exist 15 billion years ago. And if that's true, then that means that God began to exist 15 billion years ago. And some people think that it's implausible to think that God began to exist. Pantheism and panentheism also faces another problem, which says that maybe these views are just atheism in disguise. Mm. So many scientists like pantheism or panentheism because it's quite naturalistic. We say that the universe is all there is, and we just call the universe God. So you might think that there's no ontological difference between what pantheists believe and what atheists believe. Do you believe that? No, I think a pantheist and panentheist can claim that uh, their views are different from atheism. There is something special about the universe. It's not just a, uh, the universe is a pure physical thing without any additional properties that can attribute to uh, to the divinity or worship worthiness of the universe. Personally, I'm not feeling very much enthusiasm for pantheism and its progeny. To affix to the universe the title of God seems a desperate and futile move to find meaning. Still, I should learn from alternative gods. I seek help from a philosopher of religion who has no use for a personal god, Eric Steinhardt. Eric, I like the idea of alternative concepts of god because it gives me a bigger possibility space to see what might be real. The problem is when I get into it, I feel like I'm in a blizzard and the snow is so thick that I can't see anything. Pantheism, panentheism, value. Deism, and each one has its own varieties. Right, uh, yeah, it can feel like a blizzard. And 
you know, if you're a theological realist, which it sounds like you are, thinking that there's some divine reality. No, I'm not. I, 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 I'd like to see if there okay. is. Okay. All right. I, I'd like to be a theological realist. I'd like to be. I'm not. Well, but maybe this this will help with because uh, it sounds like maybe you are. So uh, you think of there's some divine reality, and we take a more scientific approach where we're trying to understand it. Right, and now we've got different theories about what it might yeah. be. Yeah, yeah. Right, and yeah. so we're trying to say, like, well, we had these old ones, but it wasn't clear they came from a kind of uh, rational scientific approach to trying to understand divine reality. Certainly, they were all pre-scientific for sure. They're pre-scientific. So now you've got people starting to use kinds of uh, images, metaphors. Uh, for instance, the computational metaphor, but for instance, metaphors of God's body or something like that. Um, think about the uh, pantheists. So pantheists have thought that God is this everything. Yeah. Now, if it's just the universe, it sounds like you're just giving another name for the universe. Yeah, it's calling right. it God's God because right. I like it right. or something. And pantheism also has the problem of it's hard to relate to the universe, except to be in it. To say the universe is God with a capital G, if you can't worship it or can't make uh, religious sense out of that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right? they, they try to put some kind of a unity or some kind of right. a spirituality into it, but I, I don't, you know, I don't see very much. I, I would agree, and that's been a problem for traditional pantheism. So people tried to th think of stronger types of pantheism. So physicists and philosophers have both thought there might be multiple universes, many universes, right, in one gigantic world somehow. So maybe it makes more sense to think of the divine as that total structure, the totality of all possible worlds or universes, right, together. And that seems to suggest that idea of, I keep saying this enclosure, of all possible universes somehow as being in this one great thing. And through its necessary existence, it brings them all into existence, all the possibilities into existence. That's a kind of pantheism that could be religiously very interesting. It's not just giving our universe another name. Maybe the more interesting question is, can we deal with gods that aren't like us? Right? Some people think that the uh, challenge to theism, theists have, are guilty of idolatry, creating God in our image. Yeah, and that's the personal part. The personal part. So maybe we should just get rid of this personal idea, and so maybe it's going to be, and I, I think it will be one of the most interesting things to see religion developing in the West of us learning to think of the divine in an impersonal way. So you asked about panentheism too, right? And that's sort of saying that there's, God contains the universe, right? Uh, but is a little bit more than the universe that it contains. So my own view, of course, with the little gods that uh, I sometimes talk about, all these little gods that contain their own universes, is panentheistic in that way. So I think gods are like computers that uh, run universes as programs inside them, right? And so the, the sort of computer that's running the universe is a little bit bigger than the universe that it's running. Think of it this way, right? There was uh, the process theologians. Process theology, that's where panentheism came from. Process theology said things like, you know, God starts out small and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So God is the uh, self-surpassing surpasser of all. Mm -hmm. You know, what I think makes more sense is to say, well, there's a God and it creates a bigger God and it creates a bigger God. Instead of having this growth process go on forever with one thing, mm -hmm. it just is, is, you start out with a little one and it makes a bigger one and it makes a bigger one. So it's a very process view already. So taking the process God and splitting it up into its stages made a lot more sense to me than just continuing. Gods who grow? I can grow to like that. Not the classic perfect being God whose perfection is so permanent it cannot change, but a God who progresses. I myself like to progress, so I'd want a God who progresses also. Traditional theologians may be appalled, but I'd lose the restraints of what God may be like. How else could alternative gods untether our God-tethered minds? At the conference, I meet a philosopher of religion from New Zealand who asserts a radical kind of divine love, John Bishop. John rejects theism, so I begin by asking him to define it. When you say the concept of theism, um, I take it you have in mind what has become the sort of standard or prevailing view, something like, God is a person without a body, 
who creates the universe ex nihilo. From uh, nothing. From nothing. And who is uh, therefore, I suppose, supremely powerful, omnipotent. He must be supremely knowing, omniscient. And he's perfectly good. Mm -hmm. And the source of our ultimate salvation. Now, that seems to be postulating some kind of absolutely supreme item. We take the natural world and then we are adding this being to it, who I think inevitably has to be conceived of rather like ourselves as a supreme personal agent. Um, and that does run into various kinds of difficulties. I mean, the problem of evil is one very obvious one, but there are other kinds of worries that people might have. A sense that uh, if, if God is sustaining everything in existence as a person, then how does he feature in relation to ordinary human personal relationships? He seems to be constantly, uh, as some philosophers have thought, spying on us, so to speak. <laughs> or, I mean, most personal relationships absolutely require that one gets times to oneself. Um, but if God is the supreme person who's always there, you're never going to get that. And then, of course, there are all the problems about how God's power relates to our freedom. Mm -hmm. I mean, surely for the best personal relationships, we need to be operating from autonomy. Mm. But it seems to me that because of those sorts of worries, it might be interesting to look at whether there are any alternatives. Okay. Do we have okay. to think of God okay. in this okay. kind of way? Okay. I mean, an interesting question to ask is, are we going to be able to do this and stay within Christianity? Or will we have to admit in all integrity yes, yes. that we're moving into a kind of post-Christian theism? Yeah. But I think, actually, if you go back and look at the origins of Christianity and go back to the Gospels themselves, you can find some support for the idea idea uh, that the reality of God is not something supernatural, but something that is wholly realized amongst us, mm. right? I mean, Jesus was proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come, it's here, it is amongst you now, right? So the idea that we always have to be thinking of God as, as this supernatural being may not be definitive of a Christian spirituality. When you hear that, when you hear that God is maybe not a in the supernatural realm, but more in the natural realm, that seems to radically diminish God. Right, yes. Well, I suppose it depends what we think this natural thing is yes. which realizes okay. the divine. And let me just remind you of an episode in the Gospels which I find really quite electrifying, where one of the apostles, Philip, says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that will suffice for us. But where is he? Show us yeah. him. And basically, Jesus says to him, look, Philip, you know, if you've, be, you've been with me all this time and you don't know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? So Jesus was, so he's almost saying to Philip, sorry, Philip, you know, there isn't anything more, you yeah. know, than what we actually have. Now, how, how could we characterize what it is that, um, you know, in the gospel story, Jesus had with his disciples? Mm -hmm. And I think the only word for it is love, mm -hmm. not, not a sentimental kind of love, but a kind of love that infinitely values um, each person for who they are. But I, I do want to retain uh, the idea of God as transcendent. And I think one can get that by saying um, that there's never any limit to the possibility of uh, the realization of love within the universe because uh, the fact that the universe is a divine creation is the very fact that it is there in order to bring about those manifestations. Uh, but does that love, you say it's impersonal, it's not a personal being that has that love, it is just the love. Uh, does it have creative force? Uh, does it does it have will? Does it have intent? Or did yes. the or did creation just happen naturally? Well, I, I think I'm committed to saying that it does have that sort of creative force, right? And certainly, when you say, could such creative power have intellect and will? Well, I and mean, intent, that, that, that yeah. seems remarkable. It just seems to be in the wrong category. Yes, right. And so I think God is literally good and literally has will and intellect and so on, but um, not in the ordinary sense. It seems to me that there is a possibility there that might allow us to show that the power of love within the universe uh, really does deserve to be regarded as divine. 
So if I understand John properly, love is the ultimate ground of being. Love itself, not the love of a personal God, because there is no personal God. Love itself would then be an alternative concept of God. But how in the world could love in the void do anything? Love alone, love not connected to a sentient mind, seems impotent. Love alone is an abstract object, and abstract objects do not cause things, much less create universes. While I can't imagine love undergirding reality, the idea of seeking ultimate reality through some deep organizing principle is tantalizing. I ask a critic of the personal God, philosopher of religion, John Schellenberg. The idea of God, as I understand it, is a religious idea. And so you might ask, what does it take for such an idea to, to, to really be religious? And that's where ultimism comes in. The kind of idea that we're talking about has three parts. Uh, the first um, is one that naturalistic scientists certainly could agree with, that we're talking about a reality that is metaphysically ultimate. By that, I mean something that is the deepest fact about the nature of things. But to get a religious idea, we have to add something more to that. Secondly, a point about value, that this is a reality that is unsurpassably valuable. Religion is about value. Uh, and thirdly, that this value can contribute to something to us. So that has, it has to be soteriologically ultimate as well. So those three kinds of ultimacy. That means a kind of a saving That's opportunity right. or something. Yes, that would be a way of talking about how our own lives are affected by this reality. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. It could, could be something that's just distant and doesn't affect us in any way at all. In that case, it would not yet be a religious ultimate. So you need so, these three yeah. characteristics three components, yeah. for an ultimate reality to be counted as, as God in the biggest sense of God right. or something religious uh, and then beyond you've got, the physical, that's right. if you will. And then you've got something of which there can be alternative conceptions, right? Sure, if, sure, if you're just sure. talking about the narrow uh, uh, traditional theistic idea, well, you can get alternative conceptions of that just by going to you know, the Baptist church over there and the Methodist <laughs> church over there and so on. But that's not very interesting. We want a much broader framework idea for all religious investigation. And that's what my idea of ultimism tries to provide, an idea that combines those three components. But it's still very general. Even when you've said that there is something, if you do, that is metaphysically, axiologically, and soteriologically ultimate, you still haven't And in simple language, it means it. There's, a, there's an ultimate reality in terms of its being, an ultimate reality in terms of its value, That's right. and an ultimate reality in terms of how it affects us. Yes. Those three categories. Right. Okay. Now, once you've set that out, you've got this framework idea, then you can start thinking about how various more specific ideas might uh, exemplify it, might fit into that framework. Give it a, give it a whirl. Uh, a pantheistic picture of God. Does it provide us with an answer to the question, what is metaphysically ultimate? What's the deepest fact of the nature of things? And I think pantheism at least tries to do so, um, at least when we've got a religious notion, um, a religious pantheism. And similarly, with regard to value, the pantheist will think that God, as she conceives God, is unsurpassably valuable. This is the most important fact about the nature of reality. That uh, God is the world and the world is God. Yes, the, most the pantheist value. will think that um, the world is God or God is the world in some way, and that, of course, can be defined variously. But by bringing to bear this idea of ultimism, I'm trying to provide a framework for thinking about pantheism as well as a host of others. Right. So let, let's look at um, uh, panentheism. Panentheism, the claim that the world is in God in some way. God's reality includes the world, but also uh, transcends it, exceeds it. Okay, so there's not an entire uh, distinction between God and the world on mm -hmm. this view, panentheism. So one of the questions you can ask the panentheist is, you know, exactly how is, is God metaphysically ultimate uh, on your scheme of things? Uh, that will provide greater clarity as to what sort of view we're dealing with here, and also help us to confirm that it really is a religious view, that it really is a conception of God. What do I learn about God from alternative gods? First, every kind of God has problems enough to chuck the entire God project? Not me, not yet. Then, here's what I learn. From religious naturalism, that if there's a God, God must conform to science. From pantheism, that we humans yearn to find meaning even by renaming the universe God. 
from panentheism, that even with a transcendent being, the physical universe could be fundamental. From a God who can grow, that development and progress could be fundamental. From love as ultimate, that principles or values could have causative powers. From the theory of ultimism, I learned that deep existence, value, and impact define religion. I find myself still preferring a personal God, or no God at all. Either of the extremes, nothing in the middle, no compromises when seeking God. Overall, what do I learn? When dealing with God, it's a struggle getting closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. This program was supported in part by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation.